And welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com, available on Pacifica Radio, on Progressive Radio Network, on iTunes, and at opednews.com slash podcasts. My guest for this show is Rianne Eisler. She's a social scientist, an activist, an attorney, and author of the best-selling book, Chalice and the Blade, which is in its 30th anniversary. It's in its 57th printing. It's in 27 different foreign editions. It's, it's, it's a classic book, it's a, it's, it's, and it's really it's played a major role in my thinking about uh, the, the, the work and the thinking that I do. So I'm really grateful to have you back on the show again. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, you've also got a number of other books you've written, Real Wealth of Nations and uh, The Power of Partnership. And uh, you are the president of the Center for Partnership Studies. And the website for that is centerforpartnership.org. And you have another website, rianneisler.com, R-I-A-N-E-E-I-S-L-E-R.com. So it's great to have you back. Well, as I said, it's great to be back, Rob. So what are the main ideas you want listeners to know and think about and then take action on? My work really uh, proposes what I think many of us uh, are looking for, which is a new way of thinking that is so urgently needed to meet really what are unprecedented environmental, social, economic, personal challenges. And uh, as I said before we started, um, as you know, my partnership model, as opposed to what I call a domination model, uh, really in many ways that sort of dovetails with your bottom-up approach. However, I uh, think that the reason that my books have hit such a chord uh, of resonance is that it really is an approach that is systemic and holistic. And when I say bottom down, I not only mean, you know, the mass of the people uh, as against, you know, supposedly our quote betters, as they used to say, not so long ago. Uh, but I also mean that we have to have a, an understanding of society that not only looks at what we, all of our conventional categories, right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern, they all leave out a huge chunk. And that chunk are the very relations that children first observe and experience childhood and family relations, gender relations. Even though we know today from neuroscience, not just psychology, that these, what children first observe and experience uh, profoundly impacts nothing less than how our brains develop the architecture of our brains and hence how we feel, think, uh, act, yes, and vote. Absolutely. I, 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 you know, I've been very influenced by the uh, work of Darshan Narvaez, who wrote the book, The Neurobiology, the Development of Human Morals. Uh, and are you familiar with her work? Uh, I actually am in one of her recent books. Oh, oh, great. Well, uh, I mean, that's exactly what you're talking about then, right? Not quite. No? Because um, Darcy, um really, I think, places, well, I think she over-idealizes indigenous societies and lumps them all together. And as a matter of fact, there are indigenous societies, the vast majority of them do orient more to the partnership side. But there are also indigenous societies, New Guinea, for example. I mean, rigid domination systems starting in the family all the way to very cruel practices in both the family and the tribe. And in so, the Talus in the Blade, you talk about how for thousands of years, humans in civilization, not indigenous people, acted in ways that were nurturing and kind and life-affirming. 
And I think that's one of the huge messages of your book, really. That is one of the messages in reclaiming our real history. Um, but I want to add something to this, Rob. I, first of all, never claimed that these societies were ideal. Uh, yes, they were more the configuration of the partnership system. Uh, they w had b more equality uh, in both the family and the state or tribe. They had more gender equity and a more generally uh, really participatory structure, and they were less violent, more peaceful. And therefore, their stories, their narratives about human nature as reflected by their art and about our relationship with nature was very different. Uh, I also want to say that I emphasize that not every uh, society uh, oriented more to the partnership side of the social scale. Uh, the vast majority in the more fertile areas did, but obviously um, something went wrong. And I think that what happened was when we split into agriculture and herding, and the herding cultures that lived more on the areas in which, if you will, the earth was not a good mother, you know, because they, they saw the earth as a great mother from whose life all of life ensued, only to return at death once again to be reborn, okay? Uh, and, and when these, uh, when during a period of, of massive climate change, um, when a horde after horde of these uh, uh, really herders came down, you saw a massive shift begin. So the very early agrarian societies still oriented more to the partnership side, like Chatalhuyak, for example. Can you thousand... explain what partnership society, yeah. I'm not sure we got to that, and you've mentioned it a couple of times, so let's describe what that is. Well, a partnership society uh, is contrasted to a domination-oriented uh, society. Uh, is it, it has, I, I, I have identified some of the core elements that we really need to look at, because those are elements where we must intervene if we are to have foundations for what we so want, you know, a more equitable, sustainable, peaceful way of life. So one part of that configuration uh, that we see not only in Chatanhuyak, but in er some, some of the main, main early foraging societies that Dr. Fry, Doug Fry, um, has thoroughly analyzed, but also uh, we, we see movement in this direction in our time. And that is a structure of both the family, I always emphasize both the family and the state or tribe, that is uh, more democratic, less authoritarian. Uh, then you have, of course, uh, more uh, equality between the female and male halves of humanity, women and men. And with this comes a greater valuing of caring, empathy, nonviolence, which are in domination systems, not appropriate for, quote, real men, right? Because they have to be tough and conquer and dominate, okay? And the third part, and they're all mutually supporting, this is not a simple cause and effect. It, it's based on systems, self-organization approaches. It's based on what we today know uh, from how, how complex systems really function. The third is that in these societies, you don't have to build in, as you do in domination systems, abuse and violence to maintain these rigid rankings man over man, man over woman, race over race, religion over religion, etc. So you have less, uh, you have some violence, you know, people lose it sometimes, but it's not institutionalized. It's not valued, you know, idealized. Well, what you describe in, in, in The Chalice and the Blade is that these 
uh, herder nomads that came down and basically destroyed the more peaceful horticultural cultures, they worshipped the blade. They worshipped they, they, their technology, their new technology was metallurgy, and they, worshipped, they literally treated the blade as a god, almost. You see that in some of their art. I mean, it's fascinating. Um, but I want to say something. Now we have guns, and they do the same thing with guns. That's right. Yeah, we still do, don't we? It's so interesting. I mean, I, I did want to make a point, though. Metallurgy actually was already developed in these more settled societies, but they seem to have used it primarily for tools, for ornaments. Uh, but these people did something else with it. Uh, you know, the lethal power of the, I mean, the chalice and the blade are really metaphors for two ways of looking at power, aren't they? Power of the blade is to dominate, to destroy, to take life. Power of the chalice, very powerful power. Power to give life, to nurture life, to illuminate life. Yes. So how is the domination culture related to authoritarianism and authoritarian figures. And what I'm always interested in is the people who are authoritarian, who are not the, the, the dominators, but the ones who need dominators. Well, the two go together, and this is where the family comes in. You know, it is not accidental that here in the United States, the rightist fundamentalist alliance for decades, ever since they first came together to defeat the Equal Rights Amendment, which would simply have said that neither the federal government nor any state can discriminate on the basis of sex. Ever since they came together, they have invested enormous energy and resources into reinstating the normative ideal of the family as what I call the domination family, a male-headed, remember the promise keepers? You know, men have only two choices. They leave their families or they control them, right? Uh, they have spent enormous resources in demonizing the partnership family and especially partnership gender relations. Uh, they have spent enormous resources in this for a reason because one of the lessons from history, which we really have to understand, is that the most repressive, authoritarian, uh, violent regimes, whether it's Hitler's Germany, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un's North Korea, you know, rightist, leftist, whether it's secular, like they are, or religious, like ISIS, or the Taliban, or the rightist fundamentalist alliance, for them a top priority is always to reinstate this, quote, traditional family, which is a code word, isn't it? For an authoritarian, rigidly male-dominated, highly punitive family. Remember these, parent, quote, parenting with God guides that they circulated to terrorize children into understanding that their parents' word is law. Now, this is really foundational, isn't it? as part of the maintenance of one of the key elements of domination systems. So the people who want that, what happens? I mean, it's fascinating, and I've studied this intensively. What happens is this, I mean, what happens is a mess, basically. Because if you're a dependent child on parents who really cause you pain, okay? But you're dependent on them. You learn two things. You learn one, you sort of conflate caring and coercion. What little caring you get is conditional, isn't it? On obedience to authority. So uh, what, what, what happens is denial, among other things. And out of denial then comes scapegoating, but also the yearning for the strong man, like the parent who will, quote, protect you. So in, in a way, I mean, I've done a lot of, uh, of interviews and writing about psychopaths, sociopaths, and narcissists. And really, what you're describing is the same kind of thing that a narcissist or a psychopath goes through. And they either become 
they either get in a relationship with a dominator or they become a dominator because they're like victims. Victims usually become perpetrators. Well, it's like uh, the, you know, the man who uh, basically uh, has to, you know, kowtow to the guy on top, right? But what does he do, you know? He dominates his wife, he kicks the dog, he punishes the child. I mean, this is psychology 1A, but we have ignored it, Rob. We have ignored these dynamics in the conventional analyses of societies. And this is really why this work, uh, the cultural transformation theory that introduced in, in, in my work that I've been teaching, I'm teaching now at the University of Alabama online, which I love. Alabama, uh, oh my. No, I love it. Um, <laughs> You're yeah. in the belly of the beast. <laughs> yes, <laughs> precisely. Uh, we've got to have a systemic view of society. And if we don't have that. What does that mean, systemic view of society? Well, systemic view is that very specifically, we take into account the entire social system, not just politics and economics as conventionally defined. And I, I really, because you know, I, I introduce in my book, The Real Wealth of Nations, a post-capitalist, post-socialist economics, but also where we all live in our family and other intimate relations where children first learn what is normal or abnormal, possible or impossible, moral or immoral. Got to take that into account and got to understand that this is an interactive relationship with what happens in politics, economics, religion, education, etc. So what are you teaching at the University of Alabama? I teach in their uh, human rights and peace program and I'm teaching my work. I'm teaching cultural transformation. So talk and, about the cultural transformation. I, I, I think okay. there's some good news happening. I think that the internet and smartphones have catalyzed a return to a more bottom-up way of seeing and I'm thinking. And I think bottom-up in some ways is, has characteristics that are similar to the partnership model that you've described. Um, so I'm hopeful, but uh, tell us about it. How, how, what are the transformational approaches that you... you are working with. I know I'm, I'm on your mailing list, so you're regularly doing workshops and seminars and webinars to, to get the message out. So talk about it. Well, the first thing that I want to say is that like you, I'm hopeful, but that doesn't mean necessarily that I'm optimistic because there's a difference. Hope means I, I believe we can do something to continue the movement towards partnership, because obviously you and I would not be having this conversation if there hadn't been some movement uh, from the nomination system to the partnership side of the continuum. So what do I mean by cultural transformation? Very simple, uh, moving more to the partnership side of the continuum. And that means moving in that direction in all relations from intimate to international and understanding how because of some of the psychological and, and really what we know from neuroscience too, that these are not disconnected, connecting the dots in a different way. Absolutely. So a little station ID now. This is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show sponsored by opednews.com, available on Pacifica Radio, Progressive Radio Network on iTunes, available at opednews.com slash podcasts and on the Oped News YouTube uh, channel. Uh, my guest for this show is Rianne Eisler. She's the author of a hugely successful book, the Chalice and the Blade, and, and, and numerous other books. And she is the president of the Center for Partnership Studies at centerforpartnership.org. And her web, other website is rianneisler.com. So we're, we're talking about how to make changes happen, how to get the world from a dominator culture, 
male dominated culture to a partnership culture where there's a lot more equality. Nate, one thing I want to mention, you haven't used the word patriarchy. Is there a reason you're not using it? Yes, I think that both matriarchy and patriarchy are two sides of a dominator coin. Our language, Rob, our language has to change. Because what does that tell us? If those are our only choices in gender relations, hey, you know, whether mothers dominate or fathers dominate, that's not what we want. We want a, the real alternative to what some people call patriarchy, which is really, it's not just fathers who rule, you know, it is a male preference. Uh, uh, but I have to say one thing, men, Men do not have a good deal for all their privilege in domination societies. I mean, to begin with, they're supposed to give nothing less than their bodies, their lives, because some guy on top wants more real estate. You know, and that's still going on. Absolutely. Uh, for another, they have to suppress part of their humanity. I mean, if, 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 uh, you know, there have been many, there's a new field called men's studies, which I know you're acquainted with, uh, because you mentioned the name of, 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 of Kimmel. Uh, uh, there's a man uh, uh, called Real, who has done wonderful work in this area. And basically, if you really think about how masculinity is culturally constructed in the nomination system, it's in a negative way. It's not being like a woman. You know, not being soft, not being caring, not being nonviolent. I mean, men, I mean, I happen to be married to a very caring man. Some women are not caring. We're talking about cultural constructs, aren't we? So yes, patriarchy, patriarchy is a very commonly used term to, to characterize the male-dominated culture. Yes, but I don't think it is only male dominated. Gender is one of, you know, the, the cultural construction of gender is one of four cornerstones of a domination system. There's childhood, which is another cornerstone. There's certainly gender. There, there, there are narratives and language. We're just talking about that. You know, a, a linguistic psychologists tell us, of course, that the categories, and especially the social categories, we are taught channel our thinking. How are they? What are some examples of that? All right, I'll give you my example. Right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern. None of these categories describe the whole social system. They just describe one or another, you know, capitalist, socialist, etc. Secondly, none of them pay attention to what I've been talking about, which is findings from nothing less than neuroscience, that we really need to understand family and what children first observe and what children first experience. Moreover, and this is really amazing to me, because when I started my research, I tried using these you know, the old filters, I mean, familiar categories. And I thought, well, wait a minute, if I'm going to answer the question, which is the question animating my work, which is what kind of conditions support the expression of our human capacities for consciousness, caring, creativity, or because we also have those, for insensitivity, cruelty, uh, and destructiveness, None of these categories work because there are highly violent, highly uh, repressive, highly uh, oppressive societies in every one of these categories. Why don't people notice that? Why are they so stuck? Well, they're so stuck because these are very convenient ways of fragmenting our consciousness. So what do you propose instead? Partnership system and domination system. Keep it that simple. Keep it that simple. Okay. And understand that what I mean by partnership system is not a completely flat organization because they're, look, we need parents, we need teachers, we need managers, we need leaders. But 
there's a difference between, again, new language, between what I call hierarchies of domination. We all know those, you know, you better obey or else, right? Pain. And what I call hierarchies of actualization, where in these hierarchies of actualization, uh, responsibility, accountability, uh, respect, benefits don't just flow from the bottom up, they flow both ways. And power, and this is interesting because it's beginning to enter the common language, as you know, including even the management literature. Powerment is not defined as just power over, you know, the manager is a cop or controller as they write, but it is the power to, to do things together, but it's also the power to do things yourself. It's power to and power with, and it is empowering, again, part of the changes in the language, rather than disempowering. We need this new language, and we've been sort of stumbling towards it. And, and my work does offer a whole new vocabulary. I, I think that's so important. I think that we're, we're finally having some open conversations about power and the different kinds of power that exist. Now you've explored the history. So how did how has power changed throughout human existence? Well, it's interesting because of course art I mean, going way back into prehistory, right? That's what we get. That's where we see, that's where we glean most of our information about prehistory is through their art. Yes, and it is a, really, art is a symbolic language, isn't it? I mean, what people, uh, and we know that most art, um, really, up to modern times, dealt mostly with the fundamental mythology of a society, including what we call the religious myths and stories. So what do we see? I mean, I, I, um, I teach a course on cultural transformation where we have four videos and people can access those, by the way, by going to centerforpartnership.org. Uh, but you know that, that caveman cartoon, right? In one hand, he's got a weapon, you know, violence. In the other hand, what's he doing? He's dragging a woman by the hair. So we show that to children before their brains are fully formed, before, long before they have critical faculties, right? So what does it tell us? That since time immemorial, violence, male dominance, uh, oppression really, and cruelty, have, that's just human nature, that's how it is. If you look at the art of the old stone age, you don't see anything remotely like that. Even well, what's really been interesting, and I will, I'll, do, I'll let you continue, but what you write about is how historians, anthropologists, they all embraced this mindset, this male dominance, violence mindset in interpreting the art and the uh, artifacts that were found. And it took women who very often to be looking at the same data, the same artifact to say, well, wait a second, you're, you're not looking at this at, at, in, an, in an, an independent thinking kind of a way. You're applying, you're stuck. And that's a huge problem, I would imagine, because it's not, I mean, these are people who don't want to do that. These are academics and, anthrop and scientists, and the last thing they want to do is define, realize that they're stuck with a mindset that is disrupting and, and distorting their way of seeing the data, the facts. Well, scientists, uh, scholars, historians, we're all born into the same culture, and we carry this dominator legacy. Now, the good news is that we've been trying to leave it behind. Uh, but I think it's important that we not only deconstruct, but also reconstruct. And that's what this work is really about, of the partnership and the domination systems. We do have another alternative. No, it's not perfect. You know, people are very strange. They will accept all kinds of horrible things 
in domination systems as well that's just the way things are but you give them an alternative and if it's not perfect right it's not good enough you've run into that i'm sure and that we really the there's an old saying that i kind of like that the perfect is the enemy of the good so i think we need to keep that in mind uh, but i i really if you go back to the imagery uh, it's absolutely amazing to me how really it was it's right there before your eyes you know i mean like in minoan crete which was already what our scholars call a quote high civilization uh but it still had uh, it still oriented more to the partnership side for example uh, there are no signs of, of warfare between the various city states you know just aren't which scholars have been who are in this mindset that that's just human nature have been going crazy trying to 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 contradict okay I mean, so strong is that worldview. And, and the kind of signs that you would look for that you don't see are, are uh, big walls, defending walls, and, and the kind of military formations that they're not. That's good. You don't see it. But what you, also, what you do see is image after image of women. Now, women, you know, and one of my exemplars of what I call a hierarchy of actualization is the so-called procession fresco. Why? Because in the center stands a woman, uh, a bare-breasted priestess, with her arms raised, you know, the same gesture of benediction the Pope still uses. And toward her uh, come uh, priests carrying fruit and wine, but they're all on the same level. Think of the later art, where what you see is so different. What you see is these rulers, whether they're supposed to be gods, or whether they're supposed to be earthly rulers, on a pedestal, sometimes much bigger than the figures below them. You see it in the art, the shift. It's so fascinating to me, and, and I so wish I wrote a book on education, um, which is it's called Tomorrow's Children, uh, Partnership Education for the 21st Century. And I highly recommend it because we do have to start with children just to give them another possibility. Because in the domination system, what, what people learn is that there are only two, two possibilities. You either dominate or you're dominated. You're either on top or on bottom. There is no partnership alternative. Now, I, I have a couple grandchildren. No, I have one grandchildren. Whoops. Uh, one grandchild. And, and I have friends with grandchildren. And uh, they've taken this approach that gives the children a lot of responsibility and gives them permission. Uh, it's, it's a whole, it's a kind of a co-parenting model. And people who are there are people who are very uncomfortable with it and they literally accuse the parents of being bad parents of doing a bad job but i think this is the kind of thing you're talking about i mean i do and i'm guilty of it myself with my granddaughter i'll say well let's do this and my daughter go no 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 no. she's going to make the decision she's three years old but and so i follow her around and you know what? I have a great time. And, and, and she gets a sense of empowerment that is so different, really. Well, look, we, by the way, on um, um, the center website, we have a connected and caring parenting guide from ages zero to four that's been endorsed by Nobel Peace laureates, by prominent uh, pediatricians like Brazelton, and I really encourage our listeners and viewers uh, to download it. What we're talking about is not that children should have no limits. Children do need rules. I mean, but, but we're talking about what, what, what some people call authoritative rather than authoritarian. Uh, and empowering, again, like your, your, your daughter or son, you know, are doing to really give agency to children. Agency is such an important concept that really gets very little discussion because 
most adults, I don't think, have much of a sense of self-agency. No, they don't. And frankly, in domination systems, if you really have agency and exercise it in a way contrary to the accepted norm, you're in deep, deep, deep trouble. It's very interesting because, you know, St. Augustine um, put it so well. He said, um, for anyone to question their station in life, it's like a finger wanting to be an eye. You know, just completely beyond the, that's St. Augustine. Well, St. Augustine was very strange because he decided that original sin, which is sort of the ancestor of the selfish genes in many ways, that that's transmitted through, through the act of intercourse that gives life. I mean, he was a little bit negative, shall we say. <laughs> okay. But he is still revered, and this is our problem. So much of the mythos, of the so-called sacred teachings, of the so-called scientific teachings, uh, have basically given us a message that, hey, the same message as a caveman cartoon, basically. What's good news again is that there's a whole group of now of evolutionary psychologists and neuroscientists. You interviewed one of them, Franz Deval, for example, who are saying, wait a minute, you know, let's, let's just look at this. And yeah, sure, we have that capacity, but hey, we are actually probably wired more for empathy, uh, for caring connection, uh, for sharing and caring, rather. You know that there, there, there's one study which I love, which showed that our brain so-called pleasure centers light up more when we share than when we win. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And, and that, Deval has that study with the monkeys or the chimps, yeah. where they, even chimps, they would prefer to share than to be treated unequally. Well, he, of course, uh, talks about a primate that we really need to pay much more attention to, which oh. is the bonobo. Yes. Because by focusing on the chimp, which is more domination oriented, you know, for example, there, there, there's some form of warfare there, it, it, male infanticide, bonobo is nothing of the kind. And yet we share the same amount of DNA with both chimps and bonobos, and not only that, bonobos are in their morpholo morphology are more like us. For example, they can have face-to-face -face sexual intercourse, and they do all the time. They, they love to share pleasure, be it sexually or so sharing food. These are the kinds of models that kids need to learn about as a possibility. Yes, yes. I, I write about them, by the way, in one of um, my favorite books that I've written is called Sacred Pleasure. And the subtitle is Sex, Myth, and the Politics of the Body. Got to pay attention to the politics of the body. What's the politics of the body? Well, it's what we've been talking about. What kind of touch does a child experience? Is the caring touch are uh, also dependent on obedience. I mean, take, take Chinese foot binding. Okay, it's an extreme example. But it was the mother who bound her little girl's feet. And this was not only in the upper classes, it was because the middle classes tend to emulate, you know, what the upper classes do. Like female circumcision too. Beg your pardon? Like female circumcision, too. It's the mother or, and women who do it to each other. Well, fine. I mean, but, but think of that. Think of what that child is learning. As the Egyptian sociologist Marnisi pointed out, uh, gena genital mutilation not only conditions uh, people to cruelty against children, uh, especially girls, of course, but it also conditions them to accept authoritarian cruelty as normal. Th these are the connections. 
that's why I'm asking people to sort of think in a more systemic way. And then we can know that we've got to really, the trend that you're talking about, about how do we really help children grow up? So another That's a trend. partnership trend. It's very important. And we're going to talk more about what we're going to do about it after this. This is, this is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com, available on Pacifica Radio on Progressive Radio Network, on iTunes at opednews.com slash podcasts, on YouTube and the Op-Ed News channel. And my guest for this show is Jan Eisler, who is the author of a fabulously successful book, The Chalice and the Blade, which is in its 30th anniversary, 57 editions, 27 foreign editions. She's written a number of other books too, The Real Wealth of Nations, and... Uh, Power of Partnership, and she is the president of the Center for Partnership Studies at centerforpartnership.org. So tell us, what are some things that people can do? What people are li listening to you, they agree with you. What can they do? What can they take away from this interview and start doing right away? All right, many of the things that people who aren't, who, who see the partnership possibility, okay? Because some people don't are already doing uh, working for gender, you know, against sexual harassment, for example, you know, a big surprise, I mean, that this exists. I don't know why anybody's surprised. But anyway, uh, working for a more economic equality certainly is part of it. Working for environmental housekeeping for really paying attention to our life support systems. These are all part of the movement of shifting from domination to partnership. This said, uh, in the course of this research, uh, there are four cornerstones that we have to really pay particular attention to and join to build. Uh, I mentioned to you earlier, that the people who are pushing us back, you know, whether it was Hitler in Germany or ISIS in the Middle East or, or the Righteous Fundamentalist Alliance here, they have paid particular attention to two of these cornerstones. Childhood, in other words, family relations, and gender relations. Why? Because these are the relations that really become almost embedded in people's brains as they grow up before, as they experience them and observe them before their critical faculties are formed. What do I mean by childhood relations? If children grow up in families that are what I call domination families, they learn some very important lessons that are essential for domination systems in position and maintenance, which is why these people pay so much attention to them. One, they're very punitive families usually. So they learn that two things. They learn that it's very painful to question orders no matter how unjust or irrational. And number two, they also learn that it's okay, even moral, to use violence to impose your will on others. And they can carry that then into every other relationship. And then we come to gender because that's another cornerstone. What do people, why, why do you think that whether it's for the Taliban or for Hitler or for Stalin for that matter, or for the Rightist Fundamentalist Alliance, that the old gender roles, you know, the male superior, female inferior, male dominates, women is dominated, male is served, woman does the serving. Why would they think that that's so basic, you know, to, to their system? Well, because look, that is a template, isn't it? Well, it certainly is a template for economic injustice. <laughs> if one kind of person is supposed to serve and the other kind of person is supposed to be served, I mean, right there, but it's also a template for every kind of domination relationship. Well, and it's a template for in-group versus out-group attitudes. So they have this template, 
and they then equate difference, whether it's racial difference, religious difference, you know, whether it's Shia against Sunni, Sunni against Shia, uh, white against black, uh, Buddhist as, against Muslim. They, 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 they equate difference with, you know, one has the right to control and the other one is supposed to be controlled. So, know, you, know, you say there are four, what are the other two? All right, well, the other two, the third one is economics and that, they're all interconnected by the way. And we have inherited two economic theories. Um, one is capitalism and the other one is socialism. And I look at them from the perspective of top-down domination economics. I mean, if you look at capitalism, for example, trickle-down economics, that is really just the newest iteration of dominator economics. As in feudal times, you know, the people on the bottom, they're supposed to content themselves with the scraps falling from the opulent tables of those on top, you know, which is idealized in some of our art on top of it. I mean, <laughs> talk, talk about brainwashing here. But what is this all about, really? We have two theories that give absolutely no value. They call it reproductive rather than productive work to caring for people starting in early childhood or caring for our nature's life support systems. I mean, for both Marx and Smith, nature was there to be exploited. As for the work of caring for people starting in childhood, that was just women's work. You know, and, and it's not part of their production equation. So I can't really go into this in the very short time we have, but I urge people to read The Real Wealth of Nations because what I propose there is, for starters, a full spectrum economic map that doesn't just include what happens in the, in the market economy, but the three life-sustaining sectors of the economy, the natural economy, the volunteer economy, and the household economy. Do you know, and, 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 we, and we have developed new metrics, by the way, to really, that are very different from GDP, social wealth economic indicators, and you can find those again by going to this website. Um, but what they do is they, Unlike GDP, which takes into account as, quote, productive activities that actually harm and take life, you know, making cigarettes, selling them, and the resulting medical costs and funeral costs, they're all great for GDP. Can you imagine? We look at what is, and this is very important, by the way, for our post-industrial age, because you know, capitalism and socialism actually came out of pre -early, very early industrial times. In the 1700s and the 1800s, we're now in the 21st century post-industrial age. Surely we need different thinking. We need... You're basically saying we're functioning with antiquated economies that have been around for years that haven't been updated or modernized. And not only that, they're economic systems that came out of times that oriented more to the domination side. Absolutely. When we, this gender system of values that elevates, you know, the quote masculine over the quote feminine was still much stronger. And it's built, it's still taught in economic schools. I mean, it, it, it really, I've written uh, quite a few articles. We have a journal called the Interdisciplinary Journal of Partnership Studies and it's housed at the University of Minnesota. It's online, peer-reviewed, free access. And I did an issue called Caring Democracy in which I have an article uh, on, uh, on caring economics. And I, if, for people who want to start with that rather than starting with the real wealth of nations, which I highly recommend, and it's even more relevant today than when I wrote it. There it is. Thank you. So, but, but give us a little bit. What is, what is a caring economy about? Well, it's really about having economic measurements 
economic policies, economic practices that recognize the economic value of the most essential human work. The work only humans can do, you know? And that's very important in our age of automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, when so many jobs, right, are being replaced. Now, I have a lot of conversations about this. Uh, and Chomsky talks about externalities that are not measured, positive and negative ones. I recently had on an economist, John Harvey, who talked about how e the, the field of economics only focuses on neoclassical economics, which leaves out all of these caring factors, all of the externalities. It leaves out jobs and families and happiness because that's the one that the leading journals pay attention to. And it's almost like this top-down system of economics keeps out all these other ideas. So what are you doing to get the economic profession and field to change, to start looking at in, and including caring economics? All right, one thing are the social wealth economic indicators. New metrics that look at two factors, human capacity development and what investments. They don't just take a snapshot at quality of life, but they show what investments make for a better outcome. So they have inputs and outputs. And what we show, for example, is that it's not coincidental that the United States has the highest child poverty rates of any so-called developed nation because we invest less than half of what other OECD nations invest in early childhood education, caring, in uh, early childhood care, caring, in family support, caring, we are the only nation that doesn't have government-funded paid parental leave. And think about it for a moment. You know, there's a lot of talk today about a guaranteed annual income in the Silicon Valley. And I wish that they would really understand that this is no way to go. That studies show that in these United States, men, of age 26 to 54 who are outside of the unemployment. They're just unworking people, quote unquote. They just don't work. They spend their time watching television, recreation, video games, drinking, etc. You've got to link the guaranteed annual income to some kind of meaningful contribution. Humans need that. And I have proposed, and so have others, by the way, by now, that it be linked to care work caring for people starting in early childhood, caring for the elderly, caring for our mothers. Those are very specific proposals. So just to, to, to sum it up, what you're saying is that there are specific measurable parameters and variables that can show that caring and, and related kinds of concerns have an effect on economic systems have a the costs of not investing in care and the benefits of investing in care have been by now thoroughly documented and they are part of our social wealth economic indicators i mean studies have shown that if the unpaid work of care in families were part of the gdp it would be anywhere between 30 and 50 percent of the reported GDP. It isn't that we can't quantify, we can't completely quantify what it does for us, you know, as humans to be cared for, but we can quantify the economic costs of not investing in this and the benefits, especially in our age. You know, this mantra that what we need for the post-industrial era is, quote, high quality human capital. Well, we know from neuroscience whether or not that's produced largely hinges, doesn't it, on the quality of care and education children receive early on. It is all so simple, but you cannot see it as long as you're stuck in this debate between capitalism versus socialism, neither of which pay attention to this, as long as you're stuck in this right-left debate or the east-west debate. So that's why our language and how we look at society 
And that takes us to the fourth cornerstone, which is narratives and language. Talk about that, please. Yeah. Well, we already covered a great deal of that. We talked about language, for example, how matriarchy and patriarchy give us the impression, hey, somebody's going to dominate or somebody's going to be dominated. You know, those are our only alternatives. And the need for the language of partnership and domination, how right and left, etc., fragment our consciousness. We've also talked about the narratives and how the old narratives uh, I always think of the caveman cartoon because it's so basic, you know, that that's human nature. How well, they... Talk more about narratives. I'm, I'm, I, I love story and narratives, so talk more about where that fits in. Well, it fits in, we humans live by stories. You know, I, I mean, it's that simple. And the story we've been told about, quote, human nature, about what's possible or impossible, what's moral or immoral, these are very much appropriate for domination systems. So the story that, that we're told is that humans evolved as brutal people who lived in uh, the law of the jungle, dog eat dog, and that we're still that way. And what you're saying, this is a dominator story. Absolutely. And it is really very important to understand what I said earlier, that at least today, you know, from the social biologists and the selfish genes thing, uh, to some of the early evolutionary psychologists to today, there's beginning to be a debate in the academy. Uh, Darsha is part of that debate. Saying, wait a minute, you know, we have another possibility. It depends on the conditions we create. And in looking at those conditions, we really have to pay attention to childhood, gender, economics, and stories and language. Absolutely. So we've got just uh, three, three minutes left. And I want to get an idea. You're doing a lot of workshops and webinars. What, who goes to them or attends them? And why would somebody go and what do they get out of them? Well, they get a great deal out of them. First of all, they get empowerment. Um, just as I get tons of mails from people who've read my books saying that it's transformed their lives, these workshops are transformative on a very deep personal level for both women and men. But what they get also is a whole new worldview where people keep writing me, you know, when I read your work or when I went to this workshop, it completely changed how I view the world. I now look at it through the lens of the partnership and domination system and things that seem random and disconnected suddenly make sense. And I am empowered now to, I feel validated and I feel empowered to be a much more effective agent, not only for personal transformation, but for social and economic transformation. Okay. And we've got to wrap. You've been listening to an interview with Rianne Eisler, who is the author of the fabulously selling Chalice and the Blade, The Real Wealth of Net Nations. She's the president of the Center for Partnership Studies at centerforpartnership.org. And her other website is rianneisler.com, R-I-A-N-E-E-I-S-L-E-R.com. Thanks so much for being on the show. It's been a pleasure to talk with you, a real pleasure.